I'm sure everyone's familiar with the historical security model where everything was within a secure perimeter. This could be, for example, the four walls of your data center. And here you have all of your application, your data, and the resources are protected and maintained within your secure network. And then your users, they would connect in via VPN to do their day job. Well, the idea here was if you could not connect to the secure network, then you couldn't access any of these resources. Well, what ended up happening is that a lot of these resources just ended up not being protected. It was very hard for organizations to get the visibility they needed, to be able to integrate all these different solutions together, and to end up with end-to-end -end security. So they had to go ahead and look for a new security model to be able to meet today's modern world. You know, we need to be able to meet our ever-changing modern workplace where people are just working from anywhere. And at the end of the day, we need to protect people, devices, applications, and data from any location. And this is where this zero trust model has really come into play. Before we go too far, I just wanna mention that the zero trust security model is a strategy. This is a strategy for you to be able to secure all your assets, really regardless of where they are. This isn't one piece of technology or software that's suddenly gonna light up zero trust for you. Your business and your security and IT professionals and everyone else is gonna to have to go through a mindset change to be able to take on this new zero trust security model. And it's going to take multiple initiatives and a roadmap and architecture to get there. So with that in mind, really the benefits here is to increase security and at the same time, increase your productivity for all of your employees. So when we talk about zero trust at Microsoft, we follow the following key principles. So first of all, it's verify explicitly. So for example, we need to make sure that we're always authenticating and authorizing on all of our available data points. So this could be user's identity, location, device health, like are you jailbroken or not? Service or workload that's trying to be accessed, data classification, and is there any anomalies? Our second principle is to use least privileged access. So for example, if an admin needs to make a change in Azure, well, we're gonna give them just enough time to be able to complete the change, and we're gonna only give them access to make the change that they need to do. We're not gonna go give them full admin rights if they don't need it. Then of course, we're gonna make sure that we protect our data throughout this journey. And lastly, you need to assume Breach. So we have to be a bit humble about our environment and make sure that if an attacker gets in, how do we minimize that blast radius? How do we easily stop them from just doing lateral movement across the company? And with this, we need to make sure that we have good visibility, we're driving our threat detection, and ultimately just improving our defense against these breaches. Then with Microsoft Zero Trust model, we have six key components. So we have identities, which we've talked about before. So ensuring that everyone has strong identities and we can authorize and authenticate everyone across the environment. Secondly, we have endpoints and some really important parts to this. One of those being visibility. How do we know what laptops, desktops, servers, and things that we may not think about as much in the enterprise, like IoT devices, for example, are within the environment. And then ensuring that devices are compliant when they're having access to our applications and our data. So we don't want jailbroken iPhones coming in and accessing our corporate SharePoint, for example. And then we have applications where we wanna go ahead and look at what SaaS applications, for example, our employees are using. And then if they have access, do they have the right permissions? And then we can even control their access based on visibility and monitoring that we see. And then we have data where we can start looking at putting policies around our data estate and making sure that we can start labeling and encrypting files and emails so they don't go into the wrong hands, for example. We then have, of course, our infrastructure where, as we talked about earlier, we need to make sure that people are using least privileged access, but also we're detecting anomalies and trends that may not be what we're expecting. So we can go ahead and proactively protect our infrastructure from attacks. And then finally, we have our network, where as we talked about earlier, in this zero trust model, we're not just 
automatically allowing you in because you're within our internal network. We need to ensure that everything is properly trusted from our users to our devices, and then we're properly segmenting our environment. So those are our key components. Now let's take a look at that in a more architectural view. When we look at the Microsoft Zero Trust architecture, really we're bringing together all the six components we just discussed, and then we're looking at how does this become an integrated and an end-to-end -end security strategy. But at the heart of this is really a policy engine that allows it to make automated and dynamic access-based decisions on trust. So we have that in the middle here. We have our organization policies and we have that real-time policy evaluation engine. So when we think about that, on the left-hand side then, we really have our inputs. So our identity, so whether that's going to make sure that we then can control things like multi-factor authentication and user risk. Like if I'm in London right now, I shouldn't be in Los Angeles within one minute. That would be impossible travel. And therefore, we might want to go ahead and challenge me for multi-factor authentication or something else. And then we have our other input, which is really our device and our endpoint. So how do we ensure that only compliant devices come within our infrastructure? So for example, we don't want any jailbroken iPhones coming in. Therefore, our policy evaluation could say, if you're jailbroken, we're going to block your access to our company resources. And then the right-hand side, here are all the things that we're protecting. So our data, we can do this again then with things like classifications and labels. And then we have our applications and how do we give adaptive access to the applications that we think are fit for our organization through to then our infrastructure and our network, ensuring that people have just the right amount of access and can access this environment but we're always monitoring it for any form of threats and anomalies. And then this is all coming together, as I say, into one integrated world where we have visibility and analytics, and we can then run automation across our whole environment based on these different security signals. Okay, so now let's double click into the Microsoft Zero Trust technologies. So we're looking at this diagram again, but now we can see some of the tech behind Zero Trust. So at the heart of this now, we have Azure Active Directory conditional access. So this is our policy engine, allowing us to inform that things are truly trusted before we give access. Then the left-hand side feeding this, we have identities coming from Microsoft Azure Active Directory. We then have our devices and our endpoints where we're using Microsoft Endpoint Manager. And I have a video all about that if you want to learn more. We then also have from the right-hand side our data where we're using Microsoft Information Protection to classify and label. We then have our Microsoft Cloud App Security, which is Microsoft's Cloud Access Security Broker, where we can bring our access through our CASB to be able to protect our cloud-based applications. And then from our infrastructure and our networking point of view, we can use Azure networking. And then across all of this, bringing in all the threat signals and all of our intelligence and our automation, we can bring that then into Azure Sentinel and Microsoft Defender. So that's a high level look of some of the tools. And there are, of course, more than that as well. But those are some of the high level technologies that go into Microsoft Zero Trust. So at this point, you might be thinking, well, this sounds great, but how does my organization get started? And luckily, there's some really great resources out there to help. So I'm just going to walk you through a few of them. So firstly, I recommend downloading the Microsoft Zero Trust Maturity Model. From here, it's going to guide you through how you can actually run your digital transformation journey, going from that traditional security model all the way through to an optimal Zero Trust model. And then I recommend you have a look at the business plan for Zero Trust. This is going to allow you to look at what does it take to make a successful strategy into a zero trust model? And from there, I recommend having a look at the deployment guidance. You can see all the technology that makes this work and see how to make sure that you can configure it within your organization. The good thing here is you probably have some of this technology already deployed. 
So that's all for today. Hopefully you've enjoyed this overview of Microsoft Zero Trust. And if you have, make sure you subscribe and we'll see you next week for another video.